now there are spots, there's a spot right behind us here, <clears throat> where you've got this big old turn, kind of sweeps like this, and it runs out like so, and it runs out like so, and you get this, it's kind of a riffle running up through this area right here, it's shallow, and then it comes pitching off of here, and it's doing this right here. And there's this big eddy right here, and it never really swirls backwards too much because it's so big and long. And you'll find a lot of the fish will be right up in here, right? But all the way on the other side of this, and I can always tell if somebody's been in my hole, because I should catch fish right here. If I come into here and, and I'm not getting any fish, there's a spot all the way over on the other side, and there's kind of a big old rock like this at the end of this riffle, and it's just a little tiny thing like that. And that, those guys will push those fish, and they'll be in this, and, and I'm talking guys, it's probably maybe 10 foot wide, maybe 30 feet long, and they'll be sitting right over here. Because what happens with the, is I gotta wade out to my hip, or to my elbows, and I gotta throw out into this fast water. And it's like, man, if I give you 20 bucks, will you stand out of where the fish are at so I can at least fish it, and then you can go back in there? Happens all the time. I see in the springtime steelheading, guys. When the water is fast, little another little lesson for you. When the water's moving fast, they've got two options. They can go down low because our current moves at different speeds. They can suck to the bottom. Or, in a, a lot of the cases in the steelhead, up higher up, it's not that deep. So they travel up the shoreline because you've got rocks and stuff out here breaking the current. They will stand right where they want to go. You might as well walk out in the fast water, turn around and throw it to shore. Because you're standing right where they want to go. I mean, you'll be down there fishing, and they come walking, and they just wait up and they Like, dude, hey man, you got the, this, you're in the highway, man. <laughs> you know? It's, just, it's the same principle here. If I stick you out in the current, being as we're all athletic, and I tell you to go charging up the shoreline or charging up the middle of that thing that's pushing against you, what's the first thing that goes through your mind? I gotta move over and find some less, well, I gotta find less current so I can move easy. They don't wanna sit out there, even as streamlined as they are, they don't wanna sit out there and battle that stuff. They're not gonna do it. They're gonna be on edges. Always gonna be on edges. Don't just 90% of the fish are in the 10% of the thing. See how it all applies, isn't it? It's all the same. I don't care what we're talking about. They just go ripping right out in the middle. Guys, if you want to wade out, get up here in the fast water, throw out. I'll hold my rod tip out like this, and I will let my jig just troll right in that split. Then when I start to get some slack, I just bounce it right back up to me. Right in that seam, if you want to wade out there. There's no need to just... They're here, man. They're not out in the ripping stuff. They're not. Guys go down salmon fishing. The water slowed down, the fish quit biting. Well, <clears throat> let me ask you a question. How deep were you fishing? Well, I had my ball right on the bottom. Because when it's fast, they go down low. When it's not, they go all around. When the water's not blowing that hard, they may be 15 feet underneath you. Coming right up through mid-level. The current's not pushing hard, they don't care. They'll go right up mid-level. A lot of the best guys down there use the shallow diving jet divers, the 20-footers, cut plug, and they kill them. Well, everybody else is sucking to the bottom. Because a lot of the time, the water ain't running hard, right? Mm -hmm. Especially down in you know, Bravenita, White Bluff area. Same principle. So, that's pretty much the basics the the using the uh, countdown Rapala, same thing you would pitch it up let it sink down and then just start to pull it tight and it's just swimming in the current as it swings and a lot of times those fish will hit right when it's swinging bang crank into you i think they're sevens yeah i think they're sevens that's usually what we run is a seven with uh, the side wash hook on it i think is a size i want to say size one i think one is what we run Put them on the, no, I put them on the tail. Yeah, the tail section, because it's not, 
with those kind of plugs, the way they work, you know, like the, the diving plugs, remember we talked about tying to the front eye of the hook closest to the bill? Well, with these ones, the way they swim, they run through the water basically horizontal. They're not tipping down. And that little tiny sidewash back there just looks like it's tail kicking. It doesn't affect the action of it unless you put too big of a hook back there. All right. The landlocked salmon, same thing. They're in there, guys, doing the same thing. You know, the only thing I can preach to you is just take care of them, man, because it, you will catch a lot of fish. And it, people, if you mishandle a trout, you will kill it. They're not like a crappie or a bass or a walleye. They're not that tough. Just got to handle them with care. Biggest fish I've ever taken out of this river back here was a 26-inch brown trout. Weighed almost 8 pounds. It was in October. Spawn fish. Biggest Chinook I've ever taken out of there was 9 pounds. I've taken several that size. People don't think in that sewage-infested pond that there's fish in there. That's pretty good fishing. I've seen some fish in there blow your mind. You ever want to see something surprising, go down to Hamilton, where it crosses, down there. Stand down there and just look, and really look hard. You will see trout swimming around in there that I bet are 10 pounds, no exaggeration, swimming down in that area. You'll see crawdads that look like lobsters from way up on the bridge. Don't eat them. Tell you a funny story about eating stuff, because I like to eat. <laughs> Down on that river, in the early part of spring on the flats, there's wild asparagus that grows. Mmm, that's good. You don't even need to cook it. We just break it off and eat it. It's the only time I eat health food. <laughs> we were down there. I went down with Mick. I went down with Mick. And we were down there, and we were fishing, and we were fishing the upper section. I actually think we did some... I think we might have done some uh, narrations or something. And I told Mick, I said, we, have you ever had the wild asparagus down here? And what's cool about this stuff, guys, is you think of asparagus, you know, being a little stalk. Well, when this stuff blooms out, it's a tree. It's just, I mean, it could be as tall as this room. I mean, it's huge. It's big little, these big yellow little things. On, yeah, all spindly. And so we're down there, and we hadn't caught nothing. We're coming out, and I told Mickey, I said, you ever had that? And he says, no, and I bust some off. And he's like, holy smokes. I mean, you don't, it's off, so tender. So I, I get down there, and I, we're, we're down on the ground, you know, just picking this stuff, and this car full of yuppies pulls up. I mean, good people. And <laughs> they get out of their vehicle, and they've got suits and ties and uh, the men in black and Mickey and our aliens. I don't know. They're just dressed all up, and they stop. And I thought, they're taking pictures. We're great. I don't know. They're just taking pictures of us. Maybe they're they, they, I don't know. thought I was a bear. I don't know. I'm not a very hairy guy, but... Anyway, so we come blowing up out of there, and this gal goes, what were you guys eating down there? And I said, well, we were eating the wild asparagus. And she goes, well, we're with the such and such environmental cleanup crew, and this is one of our sites that we're working on, and do you realize the levels of lead and mercury that are in that? I don't know if I'd eat that. And I said, well, I, said, I don't really know if a vegetable can contain that or not, do you? Well, I don't know. She's telling me, don't tell me not to eat. <laughs> I know the fish can. We don't eat the fish. I looked at them with the straightest of faces. I said, I have been eating that asparagus since I was a kid. So has my mother. The worst thing that happens is I have six toes on one side and four on the other. <laughs> and I turned around and walked off, and Mickey's standing there like, and they're just like, I had to turn around and finally start laughing, like, I'm just joking. They were probably going to write a report about it. You know? Uh, it's good stuff. I think I, I've been eating it for a long time. I'm okay. I think I saw it. Yeah. For the most part, exactly. All right, guys. Any questions? We said we were going two hours, but I guess we didn't. That's all right. Everybody good? Very good. Yep. What's that, Mark? They're all the way down to Portland. I don't know where that's at. Highway 2. Rondo's at the bottom of the big hill out of Waterville. Man, I don't, I don't know where that's at. Are you talking about like there's there's rock, like the there's well? Land. Oh, yeah, they're all down through there. Okay. The salmon guys are catching them below wells with the herring in the bunch. They, they all water ski down there, so he has no idea what they're Oh, they're, they're in there. Yeah, they're all. And that's all open through there. Isn't yep. It's all the way. You'll catch those things all the way down to Portland. They're all the way down through there. My younger brother 
lives in Longview, and a friend of his picks them off off the mouth of some of the rivers out yep. there fishing for salmon. Yep, they're up the snake now, mouth of, of the where the Walla Walla runs in. They're making their way through all of it. But yeah, there's down there the salmon guys last year did really well picking the walleyes up yeah, down I, there. I never, I'm always down there in the middle of summer when there's you know we're out there in pleasure boats. So right. I don't see anybody fishing down there. So right. I have no idea. And you go try to find any information on it. Nobody's. There's nothing on that. Yeah. Down there. Yeah, no, they're 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 down there, they're down there. They're there. I don't know population wise, but I have heard guys catching them. Yeah, but I don't know as to what extent, how many. You know, I know like yeah, that article that came out said they got some big ones up there on the mouth of Clark Fork. You know, but fishable wise, I don't know. I haven't gone and done it, but I know they are there. Yeah. Do you fish pike in the Colorado River? Uh huh. Yep. Yep. Yes, I do. <laughs> if you want to see me get possessed and, and spin my head in circles, just throw me at Northern Pike. Northern Pike and walleye are, are my fetish fish, just because they're cranky. <laughs> You'll see a footage of one in there that got away from me and, and did a really beautiful number on my hand. That was when Randy, first time. Yeah, I had, well, Chad was with me. You know, and I've handled several pike. You know, we don't usually net them, we just grab them up and... I picked this thing up, I think it was, I don't know, left or right hand, it's in the video. What's that? Your dad with you? No, it was Chadley, Chad was with me. Pick it up, and I bring it in, and I'm getting ready to talk about it, it was about 15 pounds, I think. And this thing cuts loose, and my hand went up into its mouth, and that big swim bait stuck in it, and it spun, and when it spun, my hand got so stuck that it, where the, the gill connects here, it ripped it right out. Well, in the process of ripping it out, it just like, ripped out of this too and uh, so this thing hits the deck and I'm yelling at everybody to get out of the way because it's just losing its mind you know and I felt bad because I, I terminated the fish I mean I it just went crazy I've never had one do that and the blood's running off and it's just all kind of crazy there and it's raining and the camera's you know, getting wet and it looks like blood bath in the front so I finished a little thing in there and I hand this fish to Chad because my buddy does taxidermy in Grangeville, and he said, hey, man, if you get a pike and you kill it, just will you give it to me, and I'll mount it for his display. And I thought, well, prime, because I don't keep anything big, you know, and I had no intentions of keeping it. I hand it to Chad, and this thing is, it's still cranky. And he goes to set it in a live well, and it goes, I it goes ripping away from him. So I think it was your thumb, wasn't it, Chadley? His thumb's got these three big gashes going through it. So I'm, I'm blood running everywhere. Chad's blood running everywhere. So we just like shut everything down for about an hour and a half and electrician's tape and the whole deal and uh, went back after it. If you look in the knot tying video, those of you who have it, that was the next day. Yeah, I saw them. Yeah, 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 it did a number. But I just, man, I love pike and that's one of those fish again, guys, they just, oh, the pike, that's the reason why everything's not in Coeur d'Alene. It's not true, it is not true. There's many other reasons that go into it, but if you want to fun, want to go catch a fun fish, those things will explode with two feet of line off your rod tip. Biggest one I ever caught. We called him Earl. I chased him for ten days because they're territorial, and I got him, 46 inch or about 25 pounds in the fall. He came after my stuff three times, and I finally got him to eat. And I did my thing, picture, put him back. But they're territorial. And I, when I hooked Earl, I had about five feet of line out. I was just getting ready to pick my bucktail out of the water, and he crushed it. I mean, it, it makes your heart skip a beat. When they, they blow, they don't, they'll hit the side of the boat. They don't care. They have zero fear. Zero fear. They're fun to catch. Are you usually sight fishing? What's that? Are you usually sight fishing? In the springtime, sometimes you can, but it's primarily big spinner baits, swim baits, spoons, stuff like that. Awesome fish. Yep. Yeah, Brian. A place like Rufus Woods, uh -huh. you know how it's got, it's got more current. You can find kind of little places like where the areas are, and that's where... Yeah, Rufus, the key to Rufus is you got to go down. You, on your way out, you stop by Petco, and you get small dog food. That's the technique. Okay, no, I'm just lying. If I hear one more thing about Rufus, I'm going to drop here, right here. How come we don't go to Rufus? Because I don't want to catch something that eats dog food. Here's the key with Rufus, the technique that works well down there. You can do two things. Has anybody gone and caught one of those? 
Okay, imagine me that's about this much bigger, and my head looks like an infant, and all I can do is this. <laughs> all right? That's kind of what it's like catching them. Yeah. <laughs> You're talking about walleye? Yeah. Oh, see, you got me all frustrated, Brian. <laughs> yeah, the walleye would be, you know, at the uh, when you launch down there um, at the um, Seaton Grove, Seed Grove, there's the marker buoys out there. That's a prime spot to jig because you got a big eddy. It's the same principle. You're setting up where your eddies are at. Yep, down below the net pens, there's a big eddy line that forms down there. Same principle there. And you'll find the trout in the same place. If you want to go to Rufus and catch the Alpo fish, <laughs> you can do two things. Out from the big net pens right here, my favorite technique is to go in with my boat and drop my, my, uh, my uh, bass minnow right next to the pens and catch them. If you want to get more technical. You can drop shot right around the pens. You just got to watch your graph because there's big cables down there. When you see a cable going across your graph, crank your stuff up, go over it, and drop it again. One of the more popular techniques right, down, right now down there is there's a sunken island out there off the pens. What you do is you start up at the top. You're basically using a salmon rig. Remember how I showed you to tie the double snells? Remember that? Okay. Uh, just not into drawing hooks. Oh, yeah, look at that. The double snells, okay? Here's what you're going to do with those. You're going to fish them just like you fish for the steelhead side drifting. This is the most popular way of doing it. You got a guy like this, you'd probably run a little smaller hooks. You slide on a corky right here. Then you take and thread a tube bait on, just like you would use for bass. Pumpkin, white, go through the colors. You thread it up through the center, push the tube bait down. It's kind of like a hoochie for salmon fishing. Then what you have, remember the slinky weights and stuff we showed for the steelhead? Same principle. You take this guy here, what they like to do is, oh, that prior's just getting me. You open up the tube, spray a bunch of shrimp oil in there, whatever scent you want to use, anise, whatever. Come up to the top of this guy, cast out, let the boat drift. You drift across the top of this island. This is where they catch the big ones at. Now, when the fish are aggressive, early morning times, trolling plugs, trolling Rapalas, that type of thing works well. But the most popular, consistent method is this guy right here with the corky. The corky just floats the tube up off the bottom. Right? They're, you know, I mean, they can get up big. They can get big. I'm not going to say they're not. But they just, I mean, from a fight standpoint, I mean, they just go around in circles. You know, they got a head that big and a body that big and, you know, but yeah, you can go catch a pile of them. Somebody ran a boat into the nets, cut a bunch out, and then the Indians turned a bunch out. So there's a bunch more in there right now. They are good to eat, I've been told. Okay. Yep, you just got to just trim the fat. Yep, smoke because they got a lot of oil in them. Yep, take the fat down. They will light your barbecue on fire if you don't strip them out right. <laughs> Promise. Yep. yep, cut the bellies off. That belly is just, well, you see. It's the same principle. <laughs> just like us, right? And that's where it goes first. 